Today we're focused on saving strategies for a couple in their 30s. And it's gonna be a software heavy video today. So get ready to kind of jump into a lot of numbers and I'm gonna break those down so you can really understand them. I'll be utilizing both our budget guide, which you can download below, as well as our planning software and really combining the two of them and showing our planning process through this. The goal for today is to show you how savings can really maximize your retirement abilities and allow you to either retire earlier or to retire with more income when it actually comes to that point. You're not gonna wanna miss this one, so let's just jump right in. As I mentioned, today we're focused on our planning process and I'm gonna show you what that looks like for a 30-year-old couple. So I'm gonna jump right into our budget tracker and show you what I think is actually a pretty healthy way to budget. Um, obviously, it's gonna vary from situation to situation, but it's gonna break down uh, both their expenses as well as savings abilities. And then once we have those numbers, we're gonna translate that over to our software where I'm gonna walk us through some different strategies we can utilize for savings to ensure that they're able to generate a really nice retirement starting point to be able to fund the rest of their lives. So let's create a solid strategy for this couple in their 30s looking to retire by 60. So today we're gonna to look at a couple who is living in Ontario and their combined income is 110,000 for him and 66,000 for her. So a total income of $176,000 gross. Now we first need to look at where this couple is spending their money and dissect any concerns we can see or kind of highlight any of the pros that we can see along the way. So as I mentioned there, you can see their salary and that's the net portion of their salary um, when it comes to their income. This is again, based off 110,000 for one individual and 66,000 for the other. So they have a household total monthly revenue or totally net income of $11,630. Now, based off of this, we're gonna break down into our budget tracker, which highlights a few different areas. And the first one is housing. So right off the start, you can see that their housing is actually budgeted higher than the average Canadian would be in this area. But we also need to look at the second part just directly below that, where they've actually combined their other debt payments or paid off those other debts in order to be able to afford more on their mortgage and more on housing expenses in general. So when it comes down to it, they've got a mortgage of 3,500 that they're paying per month, which accounts to 78% of this section. We also have property taxes, water and sewage, gas and hydro. Obviously you need insurance on your property. And then we've got some other miscellaneous expenses, maintenance, got to keep a bit of a budget there for maintenance as well as a $280 monthly. I've accounted this as a strata fee. So in Ontario, assuming that, you know, with a $3,500 mortgage, you're probably looking at a townhome depending on where you're living. So again, when you're looking at your debts and your housing, you need to focus on the healthy debts and making sure to pay those off as quick as possible. So that's where they've been able to do this in their 20s and early 30s to pay off their credit card, line of credits, any personal loans that they have. And now they're directing their spending or they're directing their debt repayment back into their mortgage, allowing them to pay that off a little bit quicker. Mortgages typically have the lowest interest debt, which means consolidating debts to your mortgage might make the most sense to reduce your interest expenses on a month to month basis. Now, as we scroll down further into this budget tracker, you can see a few things here. So I've highlighted communications. So your phone, TV, internet subscriptions all fall into that category. And they're spending about $400 per month on this. So it actually comes just below the average Canadian's expense of 4% of their net income. And they're spending about 3.4% of their net income on this category. Next, we're looking at food. So the average Canadian again spends about 12% on food and this couple is spending about 11.2%. So $180 a week on groceries and about $120 a week on takeout or restaurants. So typically that's one or two meals a week out um, depending on where you're eating. Next you can see is the transportation line. So this comes in the form of your car loan, your car insurance, gas and diesel expenses and also make sure to have 
have just some funds set aside for uh, maintenance on your vehicle. So that might be uh, your oil changes or tire repairs or anything else that will fall under that section. It's always good to have a bit of fund set aside to be able to cover that in the case of an emergency. So it's healthy to have a secondary almost savings account for this transportation uh, maintenance expense. Furthermore, you can see that they've got funds set aside for recreation as well. So this couple is spending around $8,000 or about one to two trips per year on vacation or travel. Um, and then they also have some club memberships due. That could just simply mean that um, they've got gym expenses or whatever type of physical recreation that they're into have some expenses tied to that. And then as you travel further down the list, we have some miscellaneous expenses as well. You know, you've got your occasional clothing expenses, gifts and donations that might accumulate, might not be all in one month, but be spread out and consist to about 6,000 for the year. Um, and then we also have some personal care, whether it's haircuts, um, you know, trips to the nail salon or anything like that would fall in that category there. And then the last piece there is they have a lot of insurance, which is honestly great to see at this point in your life because you typically have a lot to lose if you a lose your income through disability so you want to make sure that you have disability insurance that's set there whether it's a bridge with your work one or just all personal and as well as life insurance if you're to pass away is your spouse and is your family protected in that event and then finally when you look down at their total expenses of that total amount they're spending almost 10,000 per month on expenses. So that's about 86% of their net income. Now this gives them about a monthly surplus or savings abilities of $1,600 a month, which is 14% of their net income. So the goal is always to aim to get it around that 15% of your net income to savings, which I strongly recommend for anyone in their 30s looking to accumulate funds for retirement. They're really close to this goal. And honestly, if they can consistently keep it at this number, Number, then it should not be an issue at all when it comes to retirement. So now that we have their savings amount determined and we've gone through their budget to ensure that there's no major concerns within there, now we can look at where to actually direct these savings in order for them to benefit from this greatly and, and really utilize compound interest and tax returns and all of those great benefits of savings to build them a nice nest egg for when retirement comes around. And again, their goal is to retire by age 60. So I'm not only going to show you what what their savings pattern looks like, but I'm going to show you a very brief summary of what their accumulation looks like as well from 60 to age 95. So over a 35 year time span. And this can be your plan too. It might be a little bit different, obviously, because everyone's circumstances are different, but there's going to be an ability to, to do this, to save 15% of your income, to spend still quite comfortably while you're still working and being able to provide for your family in all of those cases. So don't feel like this is going to be a lot different than yours. It might look a little different on the number side, but it's going to translate very similarly when it comes to a couple in their 30s looking to, to retire maybe in 25 years or so. So just some high level numbers for this couple, we have them owning a, a place that's valued at about 875,000. Uh, this is assuming, you know, if you're in Ontario in, you know, the greater Toronto area or out in BC in Vancouver, we've got a townhome potentially. Um, they've started to pay off a good portion of that debt. They've got about a $550,000 mortgage remaining on there, as well as they've been able to generate some savings along the way as well through RSPs, TFSAs, and a bit of a non-registered emergency fund. So looking at this couple, Mr. and Mrs. Young, they're both 34 as of this year and currently they're spending around $78,000 after tax and after some of the other larger expenses which I've highlighted already. So since this couple is already homeowners, their next large goal is typically going to be building up their retirement savings. So we need to look at a couple things along with this. We also need to build up the emergency fund. We need to have a bucket for vacationing and as well as uh, assuming that they have kids and RESP 
uh, bucket as well. So those are gonna be the four goals when creating a plan for a couple in their 30s. We wanna focus on tax deduction abilities and really being able to maximize the amount of cash we can receive back on tax uh, filings in year end. So for this couple, we're gonna focus on saving more on Mr. Young's side because he has the higher income. So we're gonna highlight a couple things here. First off, you can see by that third column from the left that he's contributing to this spousal RSP account that is held by Mrs. Young. And so the reasoning for this is we want to make sure that we're leveling out their taxable um, accounts by the time they get to retirement. So we want to make sure we're splitting funds fairly equally between Mr. and Mrs. Young. As you can see by that third column from the left is the spousal RSP contribution. And over on the right side of your screen is you can see his personal RSP contributions being equal to that amount. So we're making sure that by the time that they reach retirement, they're gonna have fairly similar RSP balances. Additionally, we wanna make sure that we're continually paying into that emergency fund or saving into that emergency fund to allow them to make sure it's keeping up with their annual expenses, it's keeping up with inflation. So as they get older, or as the years go by, inflation is going to, A, it's going to increase their overall annual expenses. Typically, income is indexed to this inflation number as well. So we're gonna just constantly have some funds set aside into this emergency account to account for that in the need of, you know, say Mr. Young gets let go and he needs to cover a few months of expenses before finding a new job. And then over on this side of the screen, we've got his RESP account set up for Junior, their son, which is just going to be an annual $2,500 contribution, which is then granted the CESG amount allowing to create a bigger account than for Junior when he actually comes to university and he's going to need to draw on that for his university degree. Now looking at Mrs. Young's side of the plan, we actually aren't going to do a whole lot of savings on her side. We're gonna to wanna to be using Mr. Young's um, savings or his ability to deposit into her spousal RSP as the majority of the savings. So we're gonna focus on that, um, as well as we will again be depositing funds into that emergency account. So it is a joint account, meaning that not only looking at 2025, the third line there, not only are we depositing 500 on Mrs. Young's side, we're also depositing 500 on Mr. Young's side for a total of $1,000 a year to that account. Now, as we go through the actual plan, that's going to remain fairly consistent throughout their accumulation phases. We're gonna be focusing on dividing the savings between Mr. Young and Mrs. Young into the spousal versus RSP accounts. And that's gonna ensure that they have fairly equal amount of RSPs or taxable accounts to withdraw from when they reach retirement. And then we're going to look at anything above and beyond that is gonna be directed towards their TFSA to start building up those savings accounts that they can access on a tax-free basis. So all in all, that being said, as we scroll through their plan, they're spending 78,000 a year. Uh, that's gonna slowly increase over time to 84,000 for the next period, 90,000 for that period thereafter. And then when it comes to retirement, with again, doing very minimal spending or very minimal uh, retirement planning, uh, that comes to about $86,000 a year in 2023 purchasing power of spending through retirement. Accumulating funds isn't very difficult, but you need to be dedicated to actually following through with your budget, actually following through with that goal in mind of, I wanna retire by 60. I want a certain amount of money on an annual basis when I hit retirement. So you need to focus in on those. Make sure that you're really putting those at the forefront of your planning strategies of your personal and annual budgeting goals to make sure that can happen because unless you follow through with these, you're not gonna see the same results that you were hoping for. And it might mean that you need to push off retirement by a couple of years or five years even. So take into account these situations and really focus in on how you can make this goal of yours, this dream of yours a reality. Thanks guys for watching. I hope you were able to find this helpful and I look forward to see you on the next one.